So I'm, um, I'm trying to, to introduce you to the ideas we have regarding data triaging, in particular um, for experimental phasing. And um, so a little bit of an outline for what I'm going to talk about. And that's, so Diamond is um, the UK, um, well, yeah, so, so uh, the outline is the introduction to Diamond, sorry, um, the protein crystallography, what that is, what problem we have, and why we think machine learning could help us, give you an example of how we, what we've done so far, and what other ideas we have to use machine learning. Uh, Diamond is the UK's national synchrotron facility, so it's a particle accelerator. And um, within Diamond, I'm part of the MX Science Group. And so to give you a bit of an idea, that's my mouse. So um, on the map, you've got Oxford up here, and then you've got Diamond down here. Can you see that, I hope? And um, so it's along the A34, roughly about half an hour's drive. It's in the middle of the countryside in the nowhere. And um, so the synchrotron building itself has got made up of a ring. That's the, uh, the accelerator, um, the, the accelerator. And you've got Diamond House here where all of the admin staff is and um, the thinking goes on. And you've got the research complex, which is um, sort of a facility where we have some labs and we make uh, use of some of the lab space. In a schematic, you have the MX beam lines, it's all of the red ones. So um, you've got I-23 here, I-24, and then you've got BMXM, BMXI, um, I-341 and 4. So these comprise the MX science group from the beam line point of view. And um, so if you've ever done small molecule data, maybe some of you have in this um, group, then you probably have been down here on I-19 and the gray box there in the background, that's Diamond House. So that's that place up here. So all of these beam lines here are somewhere between zone, zone three and zone six. The beam lines themselves, so we've got um, several setups for it. The standard beam lines most users go for is IO3, IO4, IO41 and I24. They all come with some nice um, high frame rates, photo counting detectors. They all have, have some robotics and automation. So you can have up to 600 samples um, on the beam line at, at a given time. And um, they have, they have except for IO41, all have tunable energies and wavelengths. So you can do a range of experiments with uh, different beam sizes. So very small, to very big, depending on what your crystal size is. And um, yeah, so we have a few add-ons to that. Um, so VMXM is submicron, that, which means that the beam is smaller than 500 nanometers. Uh, again, tunable, so you have a range of energies for your experiments. The sample itself is in a vacuum. And um, actually, the sample is usually being so small that you can't see them with a light microscope. So how do you center it in the beam? So therefore, they use a scanning electron microscope. Um, on VMXI, which stands for in situ, the crystals are usually in plastic plates. So it's actually not on a sample mount, so you just use the whole plate, often at room temperature or generally at room temperature. And you can tilt that plate for a little bit so you can get a set handful of images. That's the maximum you get from each crystal, but you can explore in situ without manipulating the crystal how well your protein crystal is actually going to diffract. The next thing we have is an access, po uh, access point to the XFEL. In, um, in Germany, so that's the uh, free electron laser, perhaps if someone is interested in doing time resolved experiments. As I said, in the research complex, we've got some lab space for membrane protein um, uh, expression and crystallization, as well for soluble proteins. So if anyone wants to come do experiments but doesn't have the equipment, we can provide that as well. And there is the XCHEM facility, which is basically, it's um, as on IO41, it's this one here with a fixed wavelength, but it's 
geared up to very high throughput. So um, it's fragment screening into well diffracting, well established crystal systems, and then screening through small molecule fragments in a, in a high um, throughput manner. So that's round about uh, the environment where I'm working in. And then we have um, protein crystallography. So Lucy was working all on sequences, uh, but she showed you some images of kind of like helices and beta strands, colorful of a protein. The very first was her um, green fluorescent protein. If you want to have a structure like that, you can do that with um, protein crystallography and using a synchrotron. And therefore you use um, a protein crystal. This one here is, I believe, lysozyme. You put it in an X-ray beam, it diffracts, collects the diffraction pattern, so those little black spots here um, on a detector, integrate those with a, with an, um, with a software, um, and then you think, yee that's it all. But because of the way we do the experiment, we have no phase information. So from the diffracted beam, we only get the intensities, not the phases. And in order to get the phase information to create the chicken wire, which is the electron cloud around the atoms, um, we have two methods to do that, which is either experimental phasing or molecular replacement. And in experimental phasing, we introduce um, a heavy atom or we use some atoms that are part of naturally part of the protein to basically collect the before after data sets and have a phase shift in between. And, um, and this phase shift helps us to calculate the phase, the missing phase information from the diffract diffracted beam. If we use molecular replacement, we just extract this phase information from a related protein, something that's similar in sequence, we assume it will be similar in structure. And so we just copy and paste it across and um, change some atoms or the electron cloud will tell us that there are different atoms because it's a slightly different sequence and we, uh, we change that in a model and then that's how we build our um, atomic structure. So this is sort of the, the rough background. Now why do we want to make use for, for machine learning in such a setting? Well, this, to start with, it's because there are lots of advances in technology. First and foremost is the detectors, which have in the last 10 years made huge leaps forward to high frame rates and high data rates, um, readout speeds. So there's a lot of data coming through. This is combined with automation for sample exchange and sample centering, which is um, literally user-free. Um, going so far as that we have unattended data collection at Diamond, where users just send in their samples with a courier in a pre-mounted standard pins to, uh, to fit our robotic systems. And then the, the beam line does everything independently. We just press the go button and it does all of the work by itself. Um, that obviously will incur lots of data. So just an example, so combining all the automation, a 360 degree data set in a fine slicing setup will be 30 seconds on a beam line per crystal, which gives you a huge amount of data in an hour. So much so that not even the most experienced crystallographers can assess the data and make use of it. Um, there's also all of that data still needs to be properly assessed, obviously. Um, not just being collected, we want to make use of it. So all of the integration, scaling, phasing, model building and refinement need to be done. Um, we have limited computational resources, which is shared over the entire facility. So everything that's collected in the MX field cannot just simply occupy the computational cluster. Lots of our users coming nowadays are non-experts, so they use um, the facility and the producer structure as an add-on to their publication, but it's no longer they are trained crystallographers. And uh, so in general, the ambition is to have, besides high throughput data acquisition, have high throughput data analysis. So how does that fit in with my project? So uh, basically the experimental phasing example is the first one I worked on in order to get to grips with the fields of machine learning and to get more ideas of where we can deploy it in other areas in the facility and um, to make me independent of what's going on I decided to 
first of all, go for publicly available data. In this case, I used it from two structural genomics groups, one in the US and one in the UK. Um, they gave me a total of 810 structures where I got the publicly available diffraction data in order to, um, to work on the project. The data is from, Chris, uh, from proteins ranging between 6 and 100 kilodaltons. It could be single chain or being in combination with other proteins, nucleic acids, peptides, small molecules, so just several forms of complexes. The data has resolution, so details that can be seen in the structure, anywhere between an angstrom or better than an angstrom and 3.8 angstrom. So it's quite a range. It has a range of technologies in terms of um, detectors, X-ray sources, and also the way the phase problem was solved. So there's a, it's a whole mix of data I, I um, collected and, and gathered. So much so that I had to ask for additional disk space. So it, the whole bunch of the 810 structures amounts to about 10 terabyte of data, which was no longer available in our standard storage space. So I had to buy a separate storage space. Um, the data then, the diffraction images were integrated in a pipeline system using this, um, the framework ZIA2 with dials as data as image integration and aimless scaling software, everything in a Python 3 environment. Then going on to solve the phase problem for experimental phasing, I used Shellex CDE pipeline. Someone has worked with small molecules. This is um, some some uh, subroutines in that pipeline can be used for small molecules, and that's what it was essentially designed for to begin with. Again, everything in Python 3, and then extracting all of the metadata and data management in an SQLite database. So the database, just a quick look, so it's, it's basically a bunch of relational tables to describe data integration results, phasing results, and some reference statistics extracted from the corresponding PDB files found in the protein database. So what is the machine learning aspect for that one? So it's, it's largely shallow learners. So it's, it's not the deep learning uh, Lucy's just talked about, but essentially I, I used the metadata I got for, from those 810 um, structures of which I got express, able in the end to extract 703 samples. It's not a lot, but um, at least it was a starting point. Did some exploratory data analysis to find out features that are of interest. Uh, ran an initial round of training for classification. So will I be able to solve this data set using experimental phasing or not? That was the question here to just see if that works in our um, environment and um, found an algorithm using those features up here, optimized the algorithm, and then there was the implementation in Diamond's automated beamlines. So from all of the um, EDA and some initial trials, as I said, I found these six features up here. I've also explored adding the seventh one here or just use the first three, but none of these um, feature sets produced a stable a predictor as those six combined um, for this ADA boost, um, a decision tree with ADA boost. That was my most favorable predictor I found. All the other shallow learners I tried, whether it's an extreme random forest or just a simple decision tree, none of them proved to be as stable. So what does that mean in terms of um, performance stats? So essentially, um, essentially, um, it it did really really well. So I had like um, like ninety five percent accuracy, five percent of classification error. For the positive sample, it it found ninety six percent, and for the negative sample, ninety four percent of them. So I was really happy using my 
publicly available data for as a, as a really well performing um, predictor. So for comparison, an ideal system would have these scores. So I think I'm pretty close. A few errors that I'm happy with that. Uh, in order to see how good that really is, um, I went off to one of my users and asked uh, them whether they could provide me with some data that they recently collected, which is unpublished. So there's not a risk that it is in my training data. And um, they just tell me where the data is. I run my analysis pipeline on it and run the prediction on it give them the results and they tell me whether I was right or wrong. And when I did that with, um, when I did that with my, uh, was it 25 odd user samples I got, um, it was a bit sobering because I thought from what I had from my training data, it looked like a really good system. But actually when I ran it on my new data, it was only, you know, only 79% um, of accuracy and an error of 21%. I wasn't happy at all. But at that point, I didn't actually know what the reason was why the performance was so much lower. So the decision was made to deploy it anyways in Diamond's automated pipelines, just to get some experience in what it actually means running it on a larger number of data. What do these pipelines look like? So for um, an MX data set, if it comes off the beamline, has been collected and it's more than 20 images, consecutive images in a rotation data set. Basically, we do some integration in the data reduction step with two packages, fast DP and ZR2. These are in-house developments. So they analyze the data um, and produce some output, which then needs to have um, a phasing signal determined. So if the user then specified a PDB structure or provided a PDB file, this data from here gets combined with that information and the program called Dimple is run to calculate difference maps and see if anything is in that data. Um, if the user does not know anything about a related model but has a sequence file, we use that sequence file to fetch PDB files based on sequence identity and run Mr. Bump for molecular replacement using that data from here. And if none of these two apply, but we have an anomalous scatterer defined by the user, we again go off, try and calculate face information. This time is this for and after um, data, so to introduce that little face shift. And we do that either with fast EP and or big EP. So these are the two um, programs we run. This is, uh, except for Mr. Bump and Dimple, the others are all in-house developments of pipelines um, to analyze the data. To keep track of everything, we have a user database where things like the PDB file and sequences, everything can be specified and where we give feedback to the users as well, how their data performed. So for me, the interesting bit are these two steps, getting the data from the data reduction and using the provided anomalous scatterer to predict whether big EP will actually produce any output. That was my first task. So in detail for my system, that means that I have, um, yeah, the 20 is more than 20 images coming off. The ZR2 pipeline, I only said it runs on the data, it doesn't specify more, it actually does a bit more. It has two different integration engines, it runs under the hood, so you branch off into two parallel runs here, one running the software XDS and one running the software dials. They both then still rely on an anomalous scatterer to be defined, and when we have that, so these two branches run in parallel, run big EP, with those three internal sub steps. So you get again, three outputs. There's a lot of parallel running going on here. And we also trigger in parallel my prediction tool here. So all of the graphs I showed you before about the features identified from the public data and everything. So this goes into this prediction tool here. There's also some in 
additional information we need. So in order for BKP to currently run, we have a few thresholds that the data needs to fulfill. So if it comes off the um, data reduction step from zero two, we have a few thresholds. If these are uh, met, then the data gets into the BKP pipeline and we run the three sub programs, um, AutoSol, Crank2 and AutoSharp in parallel. If these are not fulfilled, then basically the pipeline currently does not get triggered. This, um, the results from this step uh, basically provide the ground truth for me at the moment. So my aim is to predict um, which of my data sets will actually result in anything positive from the BGP pipeline. Uh, a success is defined as one of the three programs produces an interpreter electron density map. For the prediction itself, I gather my, um, uh, my parameters, my, um, sorry, my features, these ones here, I get them from the ZR2 JSON file, which is produced as one of the outputs from the data reduction step, feed them into my predictor, and then basically create an output file, again, a JSON file, which has this little bit of text in it, and it gives me a chance for failure or success. At currently a threshold of 80%, which we've set, um, basically that's the probability threshold we want to achieve. So if our success has a threshold from at least, or has a probability of at least 80%, we really are convinced this is a success. Anything else is claimed or is, is labeled as a failure. It's a bit crude at the moment, but this is based on some feedback from users who said they want to have a certain level of confidence that, their, that the prediction is going to tell them it's a success. So I have been, the system has been running now for almost a year, but for the last nine months, I will give you some, um, some results. And so when we ran it for the first run in 2020, so just after New Year, and we looked at the outcoming statistics, you can tell this was not a success whatsoever. Um, we had sort of a hint that things weren't going well with, those, with the user data we used as a challenge set, but then having more statistics coming off the beam lines, it, it was quite sobering. It's, um, you, can, you can see it essentially, the predictor for either of the two integration pipelines, it predicts none of the, none of the data sets will be able to produce a big EP result which they did. I mean, the, the big EP still produced lovely structures. So why was my predictor not able to do that? And the guess was simply that the public data we used was comparably out of date to what actually data we got off the beamline. So the solution was that all of the data we got in this run one of 2020, I, I then used combined with this other data I already had, to retrain the system. I kept the same hyperparameters, everything identical, just expanded the data. And this new predictor, as it were, was then run for the rest of the year, here for run two to four. And uh, the statistics that come out are not perfect yet, not as good as I would like them to be, but it's clearly a step in the right direction. So we clearly see an improvement. So from being, of essentially giving the opposite predictions, it's now no longer at random. So there is a trend towards actually doing the right thing for both of the both of the integration programs. But looking into more details is actually for the uh, the integration software XTS. When I now predict whether the data integrated with the package will produce a BGP output, it's getting you know, about 70% of the positive cases, it finds them. So 70% of my samples, where I say they, they are going to be successfully with Big EP, actually will be. Um, with the negative samples, it's not quite so clear cut yet. On the other hand, if I use my dials pipeline, all of the results there, I'm very good in finding the cases where I will not be able to solve the structure using experimental phasing but um, I can't find any of the positive cases. So there is still a problem here, and that is basically 
that um, the two integration packages, despite producing the same statistics by name, uh, produce different output in terms of value. So I can't have a single predictor for both of the pipelines. So my summary findings therefore are that my one size fits all predictive is not suitable at the moment and I have to change the system entirely. Um, so I need one predictor for each integration package. The other thing is that just saying my experimental phasing will work yes or no as I currently do is probably not fine cut enough since I have three different pipelines within the big EP wrapper, um, the aut autosol, crank two and auto sharp. And they perform differently depending on what data I have. So I need um, to make predictions for the individual packages rather than just saying a simple yes, no. And um, so essentially I need to be far more fine cut about what I want to predict. The other crucial bit that I found is that the data that is publicly available is way out of, out of date for what I want to do in a you know, in a real life um, application that's running on current user data as it, as it comes off the beamline after data collection. So I can't rely on the public data. I have to make use of our in-house database and the user data. And so far I found that the, predict, the predictions for the dial software um, are focusing on the negative cases. So very, I would say that the predictions are too pessimistic, so I'm, I'm thinking too much, too far into the negative direction. And for the XDS integrated data, the predictions are too positive, so I'm missing all of my negative cases. But at least I'm, I'm, I'm moving into the right way, a step forward. And um, the other things to mention here is that this is not um, a one by one comparison between the integration packages. Some of the data that comes off the beamline is um, can only be integrated with one of the two packages. So all of my examples I've been using are not redundant. So there, some of them might be, but not all of them. And so the future design for this project is essentially something like that. So I have the diffraction data coming off the beamline, going through these two branches in parallel until they read the prediction step here. Then I make a prediction for each and every one of these um, uh, uh, phasing packages for the integration pipeline. And then rather than running them all in parallel, what happens at the moment? So at the moment, the, the system will trigger six parallel pipelines or, or, or runs. Each of them are extremely resource consuming, and that's one of the problems we have, hence the introduction of those thresholds for Big EP. And um, so the idea is now that rather than having thresholds, we make a prediction of which of the pipeline is the most likely to succeed, then give a hierarchical order in, in the way to execute them, so one after the other based on their chances of success. And hopefully rather than just having a limited number of runs or, or, I say, or, or having to restrict our six parallel runs by having thresholds. We are going to going the different way. We have, um, yeah, we, we open it up to basically all of the data that's coming off the beam lines, but give it an, a hierarchical order in which it should be executed. And the whole system then needs to be currently, I have, so this inner circle is sort of my own development at the moment in order to make um, to get a get to grasp with the with the whole system but this will essentially now be sort of overtaken by our user interface which holds all of the user data and then um, create sort of like a, a feedback and loop system within our own database and executing the different um, uh, the different analysis pipelines based on the predictions so, so the sort of where we are with the experimental phasing, but this is not the only project. Um, now that I've sort of understood of how the system can, can be working and sort of what are sort of the problems and the, the challenges we face, there is um, 
there's also already in place and running a similar predictor for molecular replacement success. This is not quite so important as the experimental phasing one, um, as the our users generally have a pretty good idea what sort of related structure could be useful for solving their phase problem. So we don't have to run that pipeline as often as the experimental phasing one, um, or, or the users try to do that at home themselves anyway. So they will never ever tell us what their uh, PDB search model is. We also try now and do a classification of electron density maps simply for label assignment. So the number of uh, runs or of samples we have coming off the experimental phasing analysis is large enough that I personally can't assign the labels by hand and using some cutoffs in terms of um, quality metrics we currently have are not reliable enough. So what we're looking for is simply using some convolutional, convolutional neural networks in, um, in order to you know, do some simple computer, uh, computer vision and um, classify the density maps using that and then feeding that back as a label for my prediction system. And then in collaboration with people at the LMB in Cambridge, we, are now, we have work, been working on a project over the last year to interpret electron density maps um, in the long run to then basically go away from our current way of doing model building and refinement and using a deep learning based system and um, hopefully being a bit more clever about the, how we do model building and refinement. So these are the projects I'm involved in. Obviously, it's not all my work on my own. So um, the people involved so far, is, James helped me with a lot with taking off my coding experience. Um, he was always looking into fixing my issues and raising them. Irakli is the person who's in, uh, involved in deploying everything within the analysis pipelines. I had two summer, summer students um, contributing code snippets here and there. Uh, Gwyneth, he's the PI on the project and is holding the grant money. David and Eugene are from CCP4. So CCP4 is the is a crystallographic project a suite that collects um, or, or, or holds a vast number of uh, MX software projects a sort of under an umbrella. And um, most crystallographers in their life will have used one of the programs or another. And um, so we, we are aiming for having some machine learning projects and tools included into this in the suite in the longer run. Also CCP4 pays half of my salary. And um, then my other collaborators at the LMB are Gary and Rob and Arnu was the um, uh, was the friendly user who helped me with the challenge data and provided me with some unknown samples. And yes, yeah, so for the funding, the CCP4 grant is given by BBSMC and Diamond pays the other half of, half of my salary. And um, any questions now? <laughs>